Hello, I'm Michael Smith, the museum director here at AMA's National Model Aviation Museum. Today, in celebration of National Aerobatics Day, we are excited to bring you this flyby, highlighting the Laser 200 flown by Mark Radcliffe at the 1982 Tournament of Champions. Mark recently donated the aircraft and was kind enough to spend some time talking to us about building and flying the model at the competition. Hello, my name is Mark Radcliffe, and today I am at the uh, National Model Aviation Museum in Muncie, Indiana, and I am donating an aircraft uh, that has some historic significance to the National Model Aviation Museum. This model is a 98-inch, uh, one-third scale, Laser 200 um, aerobatic airplane. Um, this aircraft was flown at the 1982 Tournament of Champions in Las Vegas. And uh, at that competition, I placed seventh place with it in the aerobatics. Um, donating it at the museum because it is, uh, it is still the original airplane, uh, has, still has the original engine in it that was flown. And um, it's, uh, I think it's in pretty good shape for being almost uh, 40 years old. So uh, we are very fortunate today uh, to have the designer of this airplane here. And his name is Wayne Allery. And Wayne is from Springfield, Ohio. And um, Wayne started the Tournament of Champions in 1978. The, the aircraft had to be a uh, scale type aircraft. And the models we were flying back then were pretty small. And the way the rules were written, uh, we needed bigger airplanes. We were doing turnaround pattern just like they fly in IMAC today. Uh, it was pretty much the start of IMAC. And um, so Wayne, uh, the designer, started thinking out of the box. It's like, we've got to have some bigger airplanes. And but some of the problems were we needed bigger engines and things like that. But uh, I'll let Wayne tell you a little bit about the design thoughts behind the airplane. And so... Thank you. Well, in any, in any event, the uh, third scale laser, or the laser itself, was chosen by my uh, good friend and F F3A pilot that was invited to the Tournament of Champions, and uh, Dean Coger. And he came to me one day, because we were looking for a design to build. He said, Wayne, he said, I think we have the, uh, the ideal design to use in the Tournament of Champions. So he showed me about, gave me information about this uh, Leo Loudenschlager's Laser 200. So that's that's where it started. We decided to to build this airplane, design it, and work up all, all the details. So anyhow, that's what we have every day. So it's very interesting that uh, Dean chose this airplane because there was a lot of history behind this airplane at the TOC. I think Mark said there there were in 1982. 10 of the 20 airplanes uh, were flown this flew this particular airplane. So, but, uh, so yeah, uh, Wayne's just uh, way ahead of, in the design curve of stuff. Um, to get you, uh, go back a little bit to how this came about, I, I think in 1978, you made a smaller version of this. That's true. And um, it was powered uh, by a a 90 size motor, uh, two cycle with a tune pipe on it. And, but it also had a gear drive system, uh, a belt drive, a two to one belt drive. So basically the engine was turning up about 14,000 RPM and the prop was running 7,000. And it was, a, it was about an 85 inch size airplane. Uh, and Wayne told me uh, last night that they had designed this bigger one to start with, but you didn't have the power in 1978 to fly it. It just wasn't there. So he, he made a smaller version. They put the, the belt drive uh, system in it and it was very successful. Uh, and I flew one of those in the 1980 tournament. So uh, they came out with this in 78, the smaller one, and everybody saw what was going on and he said, we got to go with Wayne's design. So 1980, we hit most, a lot of guys were flying the uh, 85 inch size, which is a little smaller than this with the belt drive system. So then in 82, Wayne uh, stopped, you know, engines were starting to come around a little bit. So um, 
World Engines in Cincinnati, Ohio was an importer of motors and there was an engine on the market out of Italy called the Tartan Twin. And uh, twin cylinder boxer, boxer engine horizontally opposed. It's 2.6 cubic inch uh, which, and it's about 46 cc in today's uh, stuff. And anyway, Wayne looked at that and said, I think that's enough power that we can fly this bigger airplane. Is that pretty much how? That, that's correct. Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> My dad and Wayne were good friends. Uh, we lived a couple hundred miles away, but dad says, well, we're gonna build, build one of these. So my dad, George Radcliffe, uh, built this model out of scratch from Wayne's plans. Wayne drew up all the plans. Uh, Wayne made fiberglass cowlings. Wayne made the canopies, uh, you know, vacuum formed. I mean, the man is multi-talented with what he can do. So, uh, this uh, model, as he said, it's, it's modeled after Leo Laudenslager's full-scale laser, pretty much the same paint scheme that he had. And uh, I flew it in the 82 TOC. And as Wayne mentioned, 10 of the top 20 competitors at that event were all flying Wayne's laser design. So that just tells you how far advanced it was. It, and it flew really, really well. Um, flew it with, uh, I was a single stick flyer back then. Uh, flew with a Kraft Signature uh, radio and a single stick um, and the, uh, the motor, when the motor was uh, running good and strong, uh, we could typically pull vertical, do a four point roll, maybe a couple of those and then push out over the top. So um, the engines back then were just not near as the reliability that we have today and, and uh, getting performance consistently out of them. Uh, we, we had issues of uh, some overheating and we'd have to baffle the cowling and things um, to uh, get it to work. Another factor was it's a, uh, it's a glow engine. Uh, in today's market, that would, they'd probably make that a gasoline engine and probably be a lot more reliable. But anyway, it was long before we had all the reliable uh, engines we have today, but it was uh, way ahead of its time, the, the engine. Uh, really had good power for its size. The airplane is uh, is really unique construction. Um, the, uh, the the fuselage and so forth is built like a, a giant Gillows airplane, we'll say. The the sticks and things like that. So it's extremely light and strong. Wayne come up with all of this, but the wing construction is extremely unique um, in that the ribs are foam. They they were cut out of foam, and then capped with balsa wood. And uh, the, the wings are just like feathers. It's just extremely light and strong. Uh, I've never seen one of these break in the air from aerobatics or anything like that. And uh, so uh, it's extremely good flying airplane. Uh, it's, it's light for its size. I think it weighs around 18 pounds. Uh, and back in that day, um, you know, that was just, the size of the airplane was just amazing. People were, were uh, coming out saying, you know, can't believe that this thing flies like it does. So uh, anyway, a tribute to all Wayne's hard design work and so forth. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's about it. Uh, just a little bit of memorabilia there. Uh, they gave us a trophy there with a ice bucket, silver ice bucket with our name and so forth on it. The jacket, uh, anybody that's ever followed the TOC, the pink jackets, uh, that was a big thing. That was a badge of honor if you had you know, one of those, you know, you had been invited to the biggest tournament in the world. So, um, the thing the Tournament of Champions did was, um, it, it just upped the level of, of aircraft, it upped the level of engines, upped the level of radios and so forth. Uh, and, and that's, that's what it really, I think the radios we have today, the engines we have today were all as a result of people like Wayne doing this and just, you know, uh, getting right up on the edge of the envelope where, and making stuff better, the manufacturers. So um, uh, I placed seventh with this, which was pretty decent. We had some engine problems. Uh, my dad was, my dad and I were a team and uh, dad was the builder and I was the flyer and, but we worked together and uh, we got out there, we practiced at home, things were going pretty good. I got out there and did some practice and we started having some engine overheating problems. First of all, it's Las Vegas is, I mean, I'm coming from uh, West Virginia 
and uh, you know it was kind of cool air, and we got out there, and the temperatures were up, so that that made the engine work harder. Uh, another factor that's that it took me years to finally figure it out is the altitude at Vegas, if I remember right, is roughly about 2,000 feet above sea level, and I'm flying at basically sea level or close to it. And uh, at that time, I didn't really understand that concept. I do today because I'm a full-scale pilot, but uh, the air was thinner out there, so you had to adjust the way you flew a little bit. Uh, so in the actual competition, um, I, uh, I had a few engine problems. It was, it was overheating and stuff. And I couldn't get the performance totally out of it that, you know, that I wanted. I didn't lose a flight or anything like that, but it just wasn't performing quite the way it did at home, you know, but that's the way competition is at times. Um, and yeah, um, you know, 10 out of 20 people were flying this airplane, mostly with the Tartan twin. There was, uh, I think Wolfgang Matt uh, had one there, uh, maybe with a Weber Bully on it. And Steve Helms, uh, another famous flyer in the U.S., he had one with a Weber Bully on it. So the Weber Bully motor was starting to come around a little bit. Uh, Tournament of Champions was a unique event in that it actually paid money. And um, they had $100,000 total money available. And they played first through last, got some money. First place was $20,000, I think, twenty or 25000 uh, I, seventh place, I did pretty well. I, I earned $4,000 and I can say that I used that money to help pay for my first house. So, <laughs> uh, I guess we returned professional when they started paying us money, but, um, overall, um, uh, you know, I, I, again, I think my engine issues, uh, you know, held me back a little bit, but, uh, uh Don Lowe was six, another famous flyer. Uh, he had one of these and, uh, I, Wayne, um, Dean Coger was up in there too, I believe. Fifth, Tony Fercoviak uh, was right up in the top five there. So, uh, again, they were all flying this airplane. So, uh, competitors, of course, the guy that won it was Hanno Bretner, uh, flying his big Dalatel. And, uh, and uh, I think Hanno could fly anything and make it look fantastic and win with it. But, uh, um, I, I really, this was just an amazing design airplane that uh, had excellent performance and, uh, you know, that's why so many people wanted to use it. Uh, one real unique feature that was way ahead of its time here was the exhaust system on this. And uh, the, the, the standard Tartan engine was a pretty good powerhouse motor, but there was a gentleman by the name of Don Chapman from Dayton, Ohio and Don was good friends with Wayne. And Don was really good at getting performance out of motors. So he, I don't know whether he, he would say he invented this or what, but basically this airplane, uh, if you can see underneath, has got canister pipes on it. What, what we would call canister mufflers that they're using today in iMac. And this was 1982. Uh, and he, he understood how tune pipes work and so on and so forth. You know, back in the day on a regular two-stroke engine, we were running a tune pipe that was this long. And um, so he designed these small, fat canister mufflers, extremely quiet. The airplane flew just extremely quiet. And, and other people were, if there was a few gas engines being used, you know, they're real noisy and everything. And this was just like, wow, this is really, really something. Um, but yeah, his, his mufflers made the motor really perk up. And so that was a key thing that we had going for us, the guys that were flying these that had his exhaust system on it. Um, and the original mufflers uh, were real crude looking. I mean, they were just homemade, looked like something you, you know, welded together and, and so forth. And of course, it didn't matter what they looked like, they're buried up in there. But eventually, um, after the TOC and the popularity, uh, they started manufacturing the mufflers. I think they were called VTEC mufflers, which is actually what's on here now. The original mufflers are gone on this. But after the TOC in 82, I retired from competition. Um, had, uh, uh, was married with a family and a job and a home and so on and so forth. And it was just getting to the point, it was very difficult to keep up uh, and, to, and to stay competitive. And uh, so my dad, again, in, a, in the 80s, these airplanes, 
you know, something this big just wasn't common. So uh, IMAA had started, International Miniature Aircraft Association, where for the bigger airplanes. So I was asked to go to a lot of events, uh, fly-ins, and just do demos with this and uh, to demonstrate uh, what is now typical IMAC pattern. But back then it was just, nobody was doing that. So um, I've had a number of people that uh, have come up to me over the years, even today and said, I remember when you did a demo at so-and-so air show with this airplane, you know, this airplane. So I flew it like that most of the eighties, I uh, full scale air shows. I, uh, one in particular, um, near where I live, uh, Jim Roberts was a good friend of Leo Laudenslager, the full scale pilot. And he, he and, uh, Jim Roberts and Leo Laudenslager had worked together designing the laser. So Jim Roberts had a, a laser almost identical to this. So he, he came to our airport with his laser and landed there. And then I had the model there and we, you know, he did a demo and I did a demo. So it was a pretty unique thing then. But, uh, so in the nineties, uh, the airplane pretty much retired, just hung on the wall and got kicked around the basement kind of thing. And, and, um, um, my dad passed away in the mid nineties. And so I, I, and I was kind of out of the hobby then. Um, and in the early two thousands, I started getting back in the hobby again. And so in 2011, uh, a gentleman by the name of Rusty Dose, uh, who's a current pattern flyer, uh, had a, he's from Chicago area. He, uh, had an event that he was trying to recreate the TOC and he he invited guys like me to come and and uh, so uh, I took this airplane and because of you know the I just didn't want to go through all the the changing motors and that kind of thing because the power plants we have are much better today and, and another factor I was also worried that if I put a a single cylinder engine in this yeah. thing and it might shake you know the glue joints and everything apart that was the one of the beauty about this motor super smooth motor so electric airplanes were coming around big i was flying pattern with electric and i said i'm going to put an electric motor in this airplane see how it does so i got a, a electrofly uh, or rimfire 50 cc motor they call it. it's a great big motor put it on there and uh and I, you know, put the battery system in there, two 6S batteries making 12S, and uh, pretty much same kind of prop, and went out and started flying it. And it took me a while. I was totally new with batteries and the props and everything. I, I blew up some batteries. I, you know, I spent a lot of money getting this thing tuned in, but I finally got it, got it working. And uh, the performance of it was excellent, vertical performance. I think it outperformed the, uh, the fuel engine. Uh, the airplane was a little heavier though. Um, those batteries weigh a lot and uh, and I didn't think it really performed as crisp and everything as as it did with this motor in it. Uh, but um, but yeah, I won the contest with it. I mean, it, you know, I recreated the flights that I actually flew at the TOC. And, uh, and that was another thing at the TOC that was really unique that we were just learning was you know, we had known flights. They, they'd give us the, the pattern of known flights. And then they would come up with an unknown flight. Nobody had seen it. And uh, so you had to learn to do that. And then and then we had a freestyle flight. And, and freestyle back then with this, I mean, it was pretty much your typical IMAC style flying. Uh, nobody was doing anything really radical. And then years later, when the engines developed and the radios developed, uh, that's when all the 3D things started, uh, the hovering, and I think K. Salmanzini was known as the godfather of 3D, and, and, and a, a fact of the matter is, as I was out of the hobby in the 90s, and, the, uh, and I think the last TFC was 2000, Wayne, uh, Wayne was still in it, and Wayne was still designing airplanes, and uh, Wayne, uh, you, you built and designed some airplanes for other TOC competitors over the years, didn't you? Yes, I did the Giles 200, which several competitors used. And of course, the, the Yak 54 I designed and built for TK. And um, I did design and build a, a Dalatel for Chip, but uh, 
he chose to stick with his uh, ultimate. Uh, in fact, I think he actually won the GOC with his ultimate that year. Yeah, that was 2000, I believe. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, he, I, I, you know, it was enough that my dad and I to get one airplane together a year, and he's he's uh, designing and and make drawing plans and and building airplanes, you know, for people. Uh, you even told me you even did a 50 percent size laser. Yes, that that we built two of those. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail, but the one was to give a, a gift to uh, Bill Bennett at the banquet on the 20th anniversary. And um, so anyhow, we presented that to him. He was thrilled and we were, th we were thrilled to do it for him. But uh, yeah, it's, Wayne's just uh, amazing. The, I, I just don't, don't know where we'd be today uh, in in the in the huge IMAX style airplanes if it hadn't been for his ingenuity that he did here. So, thank you very much, Wayne. Well, thank you for the compliment. Wayne, could you talk a little bit about how your designs have evolved? So, you mentioned your smaller airplanes, and then going to this larger one based on the engine. But were there things then that you took from this design that you kind of learned with this design that you carried through through some of the other airplanes? Well, basically the construction uh, that I did on the Agiles and the um, the uh, Yak 54 is basically it's the same construction as I did here. Um, but Mr. Bennett wanted to see you know the scale airplane. That's when he decided to go to scale and not use the F3A airplanes. I think the F3 airplanes were flown a couple years ago. Well, 74 through 77, F3A airplanes. Yeah. 78 was the first year of Yeah, the Mr. Bennett wanted to see more scale-like airplanes, so he, he did allow some deviation from the full-size airplanes because moments and things, if, if you can adjust the, I think it was a 10 or 15% deviation. I thought it was 10, I think you said 15. Yeah, what, something. But, uh, so you could make, we could, you could extend the tail moment, you could extend the area of the horizontal, say if you wanted to. And uh, so those deviations help, but of course these, the airplanes that the fellows designed for the TOCs, they they look, you know, like the, like the full size counterparts. So uh, that worked out real well. And I think Mr. Ben was really happy with that. Well, previously I, for Dean Koger, who's a very good friend of mine, F3 pilot. So I designed and built planes for him to fly in, in the world competition. So the, the plane that he, uh, we first used when they had pattern airplanes at the TOC previous to when they had the larger airplanes. So the EU-1 is one I designed and, and uh, built for him. It's, uh, he flew it in South Africa. Of course, they, uh, Mr. Bennett at the TOC, he, chose 10 pilots from the USA and 10 from overseas. And um, so uh, Dean was fortunate to get invited and that's that's when we decided to, he picked the laser as the airplane he wanted to fly. So that, we started to work on that. But, but like Mark said, it's built, you know, it's quarter inch balsa sticks and plywood formers and the fuselage. And, and it's, uh, I think the tail, you know, it's built up sticks, balsa sticks, see the guy wires there to keep the thing from falling apart and uh and like mark said on the wing i i set up uh, the fixture to hot wire uh half inch wide blue foam and uh blue foam ribs and um because i knew it'd be light and, and uh yeah if you pick, i picked this up carrying it in here and i would forgotten how light it was the wings are pretty light so anyhow, that's basically uh, how this uh, Laser 200 came about. Had you done anything with the foam wings before? No, the, the foam wings, I remember at Toledo, there was this gentleman up there, Ed Izzo, this was years ago, and he, he pretty much developed this cutting uh, foam, uh, cutting wings using a hot wire, but there was, it was white foam and solid sheets, which is, little lighter than this blue foam. But then, then he would sheet those wings. So I said at the time to myself, well, on this bigger airplane, rather than use a whole block of foam, why don't I set up a fixture and place in these half inch blue foam blocks. I suppose it's about four and a half inches apart, these ribs. And, and you know, set up a hot wire 
so that I could cut those. Then I would sheet, I would sheet the, the one side, of the, say I cut the top first, then I would sheet that before I would take it out of the fixture and then turn it upside down in the what was left in the fixture to cut the other side and sheet it. It's, uh, I forget, there's spruce spars, top and bottom. There's a uh, the aluminum tube in the wing with the, I made uh, glass sleeves to, to glue in the foams and the foam ribs. So that's basically how it works. And then the cowling and the canopy, you said that those were pieces that you made yourself? Yes, I made a mold, made a mold out of foam, carved it, glassed it, um, and then made a vacuum a box and you know, heat up heat up this uh, plastic on a, in a frame. And, and then uh, when it got heated up in the oven, I'd take it out quick and vacuum form it over the, the mold that I made. Of course, the engine cowling, has, you know, I just use foam, shake to what I needed, and then glass that, and then sand it all down, you know, use primer on it, and then I made a split mold. And so that's, uh, that's how these cowls were made. And the wheel pants? Same thing. Those were made out of a, you know, carb, well, that I think out of pine and, you know, hardened them up and then made a split mold for the wheel pants. It's common, it's, it's the way they're made even today, these wheel pants. So that's pretty much, uh, that's it. When uh, I'm really proud the airplane's gonna be in here. Um, couldn't think of a better place and uh, it's, it's pretty historic and I'm, I'm real excited to see how they incorporate it in there. They have a TOC display they've been working on here and it'll be nice to see it incorporated in there so we hope you enjoyed this flyby and we thank mark and wayne for stopping by and sharing their story if you liked this video tell us in the comments below and be sure to subscribe to our youtube channel for more historic content